in my screen. Uh, if you're having any issues, uh, make sure you're asking Kieran about them in the chat. But you may have everybody's faces on the right hand side of your screen. A lot of this presentation is going to be looking at some of the images uh, I have on display. So I recommend hiding that completely uh, or at least just having my face there so you, you get as much screen space as possible. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to Frog Life's Discovering Reptiles webinar. And we're going to be focusing on reptile identification and their survey methods today. I'm going to give you a really brief introduction to Frog Life. We are a national wildlife conservation charity and we have a particular focus on amphibians and reptiles. And we tend to do this in three different ways. We focus on the practical habitat management, educational workshops and training, as well as a tiny bit of research. And my project, Discovering Reptiles, really falls into educational workshops and training. And what we really want to do is we want to give people the knowledge on how to identify reptiles in their local green uh, spaces, and then survey those spaces so that they can send those reptile records to us. And that helps us identify areas that are better suited uh, to our practical habitat management and also maybe identify areas where we can do a little bit of research for the greater good. So we're gonna jump right into reptile identification. How to identify uh, common and or widespread species that we have here in the UK. And we're gonna look at four different species in total. And it's split down the middle for two lizard species and two snake species. So we're going to begin with the common or viviparous lizard. And viviparous just means that they give birth to live young. So common lizards tend to be around 13 to 14 centimetres. You can see here in the images, they actually fit quite comfortably uh, in an adult's hand. And by the way, whilst I'm going through these presentations, keep an eye on my mouse cursor because I will be using them to point out different features uh, and sort of direct your attention to certain things uh, that I would consider sort of key identifying criteria of each species. So you can immediately, immediately see across all of these images, the colour is very varied. They're usually some shade of brown, but that can vary quite significantly. They have a lot of flecks and spots, but you'll usually find a dark vertebral stripe running down the center. So you can see it here on this individual and here on this individual. And you can actually use this vertebral line to identify whether the lizard is male or whether it's female. It doesn't always work, but quite often you'll find an unbroken line, unbroken vertebral line on the lizard means it's female. And if you take a look at the image in the top left, this line is broken in a lot of places and there's far more flex and spots than on this individual. So it's the female that tends to have these unbroken lines and darker flanks, whereas the males tend to have the broken line and more flex and dots. Now the juveniles are born very small, only about four centimeters, and they're almost entirely black. So this is a juvenile up here in the top right. And you can see how dark that individual is. And it's only as they grow into adulthood uh, and they mature that they grow into their sort of adult coloration, browns, yellows, and dull greens. There are a few other things you can look at to sex your common lizards. The males tend to have larger heads, but slimmer bodies. So this is a good example of a male here in the bottom right. They also develop these bulges at the base of the tail, particularly during the breeding season. And we'll get onto when that is a little bit later in the presentation. Now they can often be mistaken for newts, common lizards. And you may have noticed, I have not talked about this image here in the bottom left, because this is a newt. And there's a number of things you can do um, to work out whether you have found a common lizard or a newt. And I think the best thing to do really is just approach whatever you've found. And if it scuttles away very quickly uh, without giving you any opportunity to get up close and examine what it is, 
it's probably a lizard. Lizards are very quick and very fast. They don't want to stay in one spot and they certainly won't let you get a good view of them if they know you're there. Newts, on the other hand, when they're on land, are very slow and very sluggish and even their best attempts at trying to get away from you, you're probably going to be able to pick them up. However, there's a number of other things you could do as well. This image here in the top left gives you a really clear view of the individual scales that common lizards have. So lizards have very scaly skin. If we look at the newt, there are no scales at all. So when they're on land, their skin actually feels quite velvety. If it's damp or wet, or if they've just come out of water, that will be a little bit slicker and it will actually have a bit of a sheen to it. But newts do not have scales, whereas lizards do. And then finally, if you get close up enough to whatever you've spotted uh, and you get to, to view it for quite a long time, count the toes on the front foot. Okay, not many people use this one because it's pretty hard to do. But if you can count four toes, it's a newt. And if you can count five toes, it's a lizard. So the common lizard is fairly widespread and fairly common throughout the UK. And when you're doing your reptile surveys, this is probably the one you might find the most because they love to be out in open, sunny areas exposing themselves. And that makes them very, very easy to survey. So moving on to our other lizard species. And everybody's favorite fact is that slow worms are legless lizards. So you can see across all the pictures, they kind of look like snakes but they're not, they're legless lizards. Much bigger than the common lizards, they do grow up to around 35 or 40 centimeters, and they can grow really big up to around 50 centimeters. And the coloration is far more uh, distinctive between the sexes for the slow worm, uh, certainly in comparison to, to the common lizard. So this is a female we've got here in the top left, and you can see it's this beautiful golden bronze, almost, uh, yeah, golden in colour. Um, and it's got these dark flanks. So on either side of the female slow worm, you'll see darker sides as to what you find on top. Sometimes they'll have a very dark vertebral line, not quite as prominent as the common lizard. But if you look closely, you'll see some very faint lines running down the length of the female. And you tend not to get that on males. The males are this kind of more boring brown or grey colour. But once in a while, you may find this blue flecking all the way down the male's body. And you'll find that on some males, not all of them. They tend to develop it uh, the older they get. Uh, and some develop really, really prominent blue flecks like this individual here in this picture. Uh, and some of them will just have one or two flecks. Um, so it doesn't always develop that, those beautiful blue spots. Uh, but if you do find them, it's always on a male. The juveniles, again, are very small in comparison to the males, uh, sorry, the uh, adults, only around four or eight centimeters in length. And they kind of resemble the females, but far more uh, pronounced. So they have jet black flanks, this jet black vertebral line running along the top of the body, and then this really striking uh, golden bronze color. And as you get later on in the season, towards the end of August, maybe September, if you are looking for slow worms, you'll quite often find many, many juveniles uh, all bunched up together underneath rocks, underneath stones, uh, all tangled up like little slow worm spaghettis. Um, so I did mention you can confuse these with snakes and the best thing to look for is actually the skin. Okay, so slow worms have very smooth, even though they do have scales, they've got very smooth, sleek skin. You can see the sheen across every single one of these images, whereas the scales are far more pronounced on snakes. But as well as that, you can take a look at the eyes. And if you watch them long enough, you will find that slow worms blink uh, because they have eyelids. Snakes do not have eyelids, so it is impossible for them to blink. Moving on to the grass snakes, the first of our snake species uh, that we consider common or widespread. Now these are 
very big in comparison to the other species we just, we've just looked at. So the, the adults do grow to around 60 or 100 centimetres, uh, and the females are larger than the males with respect to age, so they're around 25% bigger than the males. And the females can get up to a metre and a half. Uh, the first time you see a really whopping big female, uh, it can really take your breath away. A fantastic looking snakes. And uh, one of the species that still give you that wow factor uh, when you spot them in the wild. And they're usually this sort of green or dark olive colour. So you can see across all three of the individuals that we have here, they're a sort of green or dark olive. And what you want to look for to give you that positive ID on the grass snake is this yellow collar behind the head. So you can see it here, and you can see it here, and you can see it here as well. So quite often uh, when you're surveying for reptiles, you'll catch, capture a very quick glimpse of them, and you're just looking for one or two things that give them away. For grass snakes, that's usually the yellow collar behind the head, or these dark bars running down the length of the flanks. So you can see it quite clearly in the bottom image. They've got these dark bars here. And that actually gives uh, the particular species of grass snake that we have here in the UK um, their other common name. So we would consider them barred grass snakes here in the UK. Now the juveniles are kind of like smaller versions of the adults. They are born with that yellow collar. They're born with the dark bars on the flanks. They're just much smaller at around 20 centimeters in length. Now it can be really tricky to tell the difference between the males and females. There's one or two things you can take a look at. First of all, I would take a look at the head. So we have a female here in the top left. And you can see where the head meets the body. It's very distinctive, very prominent head that fits onto a very small skinny body. If we look at the male, we've got a male here in the right hand side image. That's far less pronounced. And although you can see where the head meets the body by the yellow color, uh, it's far less distinctive. And then if we move to the other end of the snake, in this image on the top left, so this is the female, the body tapers off really quite quickly and suddenly. So around here is where the body tapers off into a tail. So believe it or not, snakes actually have tails. They're not just one big long body. And in the females, that tapers off very quickly, very suddenly. They have short tails in comparison to their bodies. And in the males, it's almost impossible sometimes to tell where the body finishes and where the tail begins. Uh, and to actually determine that, you would have to flip the snake over and you'd have to identify something called the vent. And you'd work out where the tail is uh, in comparison to where the vent is situated on the body. But you'll find that the males have much longer tails. It's much harder to see where the body finishes and the, the tail begins. So the grass snake, you may confuse with the adder if you're out and about. Um, and there's a few things that you can do to determine the difference. Uh, one of them is looking at the eyes. So you can see quite clearly that they have circular pupils with yellow irises. And we're gonna seamlessly move on to the adder, where you can see very thin slit-like pupils with a red iris. So the adders have a very dangerous look about them, uh, whereas the grass snakes don't. That's probably one of the main differences that you can look at between the two uh, to tell what species you have. But I would say one of the main things you're looking for on the adder is this zigzag pattern that starts at the top of the head with a V shape that runs the length of the body. And almost every adder has uh, these zigzag patterns that run the length of the body. And there's a lot of variation between them. So some may be very pronounced zigzags, some may not be pronounced at all. I've seen pictures of adders that don't have a zigzag, they just have a very blocky line down their body, you will usually find some sort of marking running the length of the body that is usually a zigzag pattern. So you can tell the difference between the males and the females, usually by the coloration. So we have a male here on the right hand side and 
they tend to be a greyish colour with a black zigzag pattern. And the females tend to be this sort of light brown colour with a darker browner zigzag. And in the top left here, we've got a juvenile. They tend to be this sort of gingery or brick red colour. Uh, they will usually have, again, that zigzag pattern that runs the length of the body. That's what you're looking for when it comes to adders. And so the adders are a tiny bit smaller uh, than our grass snakes, uh, I failed to mention. So they're around 60 to 80 centimetres. So they don't quite get to the length that the grass snake gets to, but they are far stockier. They're a very thick set uh, snake. And you'll notice if you're ever comparing the two, uh, adders look a lot fatter than grass snakes. So the adder is our only native venomous snake. So they are venomous, you do not want to be bitten by an adder, but they do it very, very rarely. They are not an aggressive species in the slightest. If they are disturbed, their first instinct is just to slither away into the undergrowth, undergrowth where you won't be able to follow them. And they will hiss and they will um, put on a display if you continue to wind them up before they will bite you. And adder bites are very, very rare and even rarer uh, to be fatal. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a very quick look at the general seasonal life cycle of the four um, reptiles that we, we've mentioned. So they follow a rough pattern. Uh, they're not identical between the species. Generally speaking, uh, they follow the same pattern. So between February and April, they're gonna be leaving their hibernation site. So all the reptiles here hibernate, and they'll be doing that between October and March, but they'll leave those hibernation sites around February or April. Uh, adders and common lizards are probably the first to emerge from their sites. And the further south in the country, and the further west in the country you are, the sooner this tends to be. So they'll start to come out when the warmer weather appears, uh, but the further north you are, uh, the further behind you are in the seasonal calendar, uh, and the longer it will take for them to emerge from those sites. Uh, grass snakes are probably the latest out of these four species to start emerging from their, their hibernation sites. So between March and May, uh, this is when the breeding starts to occur for all of the species. So the males of, uh, I think all, of, all four of the species will leave first, and they're looking to sloth their, their winter skin to look as sexy as they can for the females. Uh, and it's during this, this period of time that you'll quite often see uh, the males fighting one another uh, for access to good spots for basking and access to the females. So the lizard species, the common lizards and the slow worms, they'll scrap it out. They'll bite each other, they'll thrash around. It's usually the strongest male that wins uh, the rights to the females or the rights to a particular good basking area. Adders, on the other hand, uh, and you may have seen this on the latest Spring Watch, they will do something called the Dance of Adders. And this isn't a courtship, this is a dance between two male adders. Um, and it's a bit of a gentleman's rule amongst adders that they shall not bite one another. Uh, so they sort of writhe around off the ground, and what they're trying to do is force the other one to the ground uh, to sort of show their superiority. Uh, and grass snakes do something completely different. Uh, they, they don't fight each other to compete for females. They create something called a mating ball. And it's actually a big biological tangleweed of snakes uh, with many males competing for the uh, rights to, to, to mate with a, a, a female. Uh, and it's usually the biggest male, the strongest male that wins those rights. Gone off on a bit of a tangent there. Um, so April to August, you'll find that all the species I've just touched on, uh, apart from the grass snake, will incubate their young internally. So they will hold their eggs inside them and they will incubate them internally and then give birth to live young later in the season. Whereas grass snakes will lay their eggs in uh, what we call nesting piles. So that could be rotting vegetation, that could be compost heaps, and my personal favourite is manure piles. So if you are a landowner and you know you have grass snakes, the single best thing you can do uh, is provide nice, big, extensive piles of manure. 
because it provides everything uh, that grass snake eggs need in order to, to incubate correctly. And then between August and October, uh, you tend to get a bit of a lull in activity uh, from, from reptiles in, the, in the, the summer months, so July and August. But then it's towards the end of August, beginning of September, you get this flurry of activity where they're trying to feed as often as possible and as much as possible so that they put on weight to survive the overwintering period. And then between October and March, they go into their hibernation sites uh, and the cycle continues. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we're gonna move on to how to actually perform a reptile visual survey. So you know how to identify the common and widespread reptiles. How do you actually go out and look for them? We're gonna bring all those elements together. But first I'm gonna very briefly touch on um, thermoregulation. Because if we understand how a reptile thermo regulates, we can better exploit their behavior uh, so that we get good survey results. So we actually see them in the wild. So thermoregulation is just the process by which any species, uh, such as me and you, manage their temperature within a certain range. We're endothermic. We tend to rely on internal processes, whereas reptiles are exothermic and they will use their environment to, to thermoregulate. And their preferred temperature range is around 25 to 30 centigrade. And they tend to get to this preferred temperature range via basking. Okay, so they'll have come out from their uh, overnight site, they won't be at their preferred temperature range, and they will try it, they will bask. So we call it basking when they are usually in an open or sunny spot, and they're looking to get their temperature to this range as soon as possible. Uh, they don't enjoy basking, to the best of my knowledge. Um, they want to get it over and done with as quickly as possible so they can do more interesting things like feeding and mating and whatever reptiles like to do in the day. But they do this primarily through basking. But they will also do it uh, from retaining heat or conducting heat from items in their environment as well. And it's also worth mentioning that reptiles can get too hot and they will use their environment to cool down as well as heat up. Uh, and finally, adders and common lizards are very, very good at thermoregulation. Um, so here in the UK, we're actually at the edge of the range of quite a few uh, of our reptile species. But adders and common lizards are probably the most widespread uh, across the UK. And you do get them at the, you know, the far reaches of Maine and Scotland. And this is because they're really, really good at thermoregulation. They can actually flatten their bodies to increase their surface area so it gets more direct sunshine. But also if, there's, if they're sat on something warmer than their, you know, than their body or the surrounding environment, they'll be able to conduct more heat. Okay, so when is best to survey? We kind of know when reptiles are active. They're active between February and October but you'll get the best results if you survey between March and May. And then I spoke a little bit about that lull in activity. And then there's that flurry of activity, that second peak between September and October. So if you're looking to do your surveys, this is when I would concentrate. The time of the day does make a difference. I would recommend the morning as the best window of opportunity. So depending on your perspective, early morning to sort of mid-morning, around nine o'clock to 11. And then they tend to hide away during the heat of the day, but might be out a little bit later in the evening between sort of four and six o'clock. And this may be earlier or later, depending on the weather. Okay, so you, ha you have to always keep the weather in mind. So the best temperature range to, to go and survey for reptiles is going to be between nine and 18 degrees. But if it's very cool, so if it's towards nine degrees, um, they're going to be out later and they will probably be out basking longer because they need to get to that temperature range before they go and do anything. Um, whereas if it's 18 degrees or, or higher, they're going to be out earlier in the day and they're going to stop basking earlier in the day as well. So you do sort of have to tailor when you go out based on the weather. So in cooler temperatures, so if we imagine, let's say we want to go and survey 
an area we know adders might be present. Um, and we might want to do that in February or March when they, they're starting to emerge. The temperatures are going to be cooler, certainly more like nine degrees and 18 degrees. On those days, bright sunshine is going to be the, the best bet in order to, to go and survey. So they're going to be out in that direct sunshine. They're not going to want any hazy weather. In fact, they may just stay in their hibernation sites if it isn't hot enough, if there is less direct sunshine. And in warmer days, like the ones we have now in August, those hazy, cloudy days that have a very high ambient temperature, uh, those hazy days are going to be best. Bright sunshine above 18 degrees is not going to be great weather for surveying reptiles. And as well as that, you've got to consider whether it's rainy or if it's very windy. Uh, lots of rain and lots of wind tend to make it unsuitable for, for surveying. And in fact, I always maintain that if you want to get into ecology, the smartest choice you'll ever make is getting into things like reptile ecology. Because it's a real excuse not to go out in the wet and windy weather <laughs> because you're not going to be able to survey for anything. Uh, I imagine it's the, the very same for things like um, butterflies as well. You know, oh, I can't go out today because it's not sunny. Isn't that, isn't that a damn shame? Okay, moving on. I'm going to take a look at why visual surveys are great. And I think these are such fantastic uh, surveys to do because it requires such low effort. You just need the will to go out to your local green space and look for reptiles. You don't need equipment. You don't need permission. You don't even need a lot of experience you just need to build on what you've got and you need to learn the knack of where to look for reptiles and this is a really good place to start however it's worth mentioning some of the negatives of a visual survey for reptiles so it's not great at detecting slow worms slow worms tend to be underneath things they don't bask out in direct sunshine as much as adders or as much as grass snakes or certainly not as much as common lizards uh, so you do have to be looking specifically for them. And a visual survey is very inappropriate for determining absence of a species. So this is an age old uh, sort of problem with, with biological recording. If you've not seen a species, that doesn't mean it's not there. You may have been unlucky. It may be a shy species, a cryptic species that you just haven't managed to spot but you will never most of the time be able to determine absence just by visually encountering, uh, encountering that, that species. And there are other methods that are better for determining absence. And as well as that, survey results are not comparable between surveyors. And in some ways they're not comparable within surveyors uh, over a long period of time, because you just get better at finding reptiles. So even though it looks like the reptile you know, how many reptiles you see in a survey is going up year by year, you might just be getting better at it. This ties in a little bit to something, uh, what we call survey effort. But if you are looking to do a survey on a site, your results are going to differ from somebody else's. Okay, so how do you do a visual survey? Um, pretty simple, actually. You just want to set a route. So a circular route is always a good bet. So you identify where you want to go, you identify where you want to walk, and you just walk very slowly scanning your head. We're going to go over in the next few slides where you want to be training your gaze, where you actually want to be scanning. And you want to tread fairly lightly, so you don't want to be tramp tramping through big thickets of vegetation. That is going to scare off any reptiles. Uh, so you want to be on probably some less worn paths where you can tread lightly. You want to avoid casting shadows that might scare them off to try and get your shadow behind you. And you do want to listen for movement. Most of the time you'll hear them before you actually see them. And when they scuttle off, uh, they do make a bit of a, a bit of a noise and you'll learn to, to remember that noise, to identify that noise. And what you can do is you can actually take five or six steps back, wait a couple of minutes, and common lizards in particular will go back to the exact same spot they were at uh, and just resume basking. And that ties into the patience bullet point I've got here. You do need to be patient. You do need to take it slowly. And you may have to visit a, a site or 
uh, multiple times before you see your first reptile. So I will show you a picture of mosaic basking and what it is later on uh, in the next few slides. It's certainly easier to show than explain. And I've got a list here of some good reptile habitats. So if you're thinking of doing a visual survey in your local areas, maybe focus on some of the, the habitats that I've got listed here. Heathland is excellent. If you live near Heathland, it is probably the best habitat uh, for reptiles. And most Heathland has populations of, of different reptiles, um, but it basically provides everything a reptile might ever need in, in, its, in its life. Uh, so that's where I would start. But any of these tend to be good places to start your surveys. So do take a note. And we're getting on to where to look. And if I can, if you, if I can get you to take away one thing from this, this presentation, uh, this webinar, is that you want to be looking between uh, habitats, so habitat interfaces. So where one habitat transitions into another, it's something we call an ecotone. And they are perfect for reptiles uh, that want to thermoregulate. Okay, so in this image here, if I was performing a visual survey, I wouldn't be looking in the middle of this grassland. I'd be looking at the edges of where this uh, heath or this gorse meets this grass. So if you're following my cursor, I'd be looking at the very edges, at the habitat interfaces. So it's where different habitats meet. That's where you want to be training your gaze. And luckily for us, they tend to meet uh, along paths that we make. So here we've got a bit of heathland. And we've got this path here amongst the heather. And I would be walking up this path, looking at the bottom of the heather, they may be on top of the heather, but I wouldn't be looking in the middle of this heather patch. I'd be looking at where this heather meets this footpath. Don't quite know where that footpath actually goes at the top of this picture, but I'd be very tempted to walk along here and see if there are any, are any basking reptiles where this heather meets these trees here. It's in between different habitats, the habitat interfaces. And any sites that you might be near that have areas of varied height structure. So they use that height structure to thermoregulate, so short grass into long grass, into scrub, into woodland edge. Anywhere you have this variation instead of this sort of monoculture is going to be the best place to start your reptile survey. So yeah, I've talked about the edges of habitat. If I was here in this picture, I'd be thinking this stone wall looks like an excellent place uh, for reptiles to, to hibernate. And this sort of dank grassland here where it meets the stone wall is gonna be perfect for basking. So they may come out of their hibernation site and along here is where they're gonna be basking. Now finally, any areas that are just sunny. Okay, there's no point surveying an area that's just completely shaded throughout the entire day. Anywhere that's south facing and close to shelter is going to be a really good place to start looking. So in this image, we can see bright sunshine next to some cover here. So we've got some, some scrub. And I would be looking at this grassland where it meets the scrub so that when they're disturbed, if there is a reptile there, you know exactly where they're going to be going. They're going to be disappearing into that scrub so they can't be followed and so you cannot eat them. Uh, and I said I'd show you mosaic basking. This is exactly what it is. So we've got an adder here. Mosaic basking is just where they expose uh, a bit of their body or a large part of their body um, and it makes them very, very difficult to see. It looks quite obvious here. That's because it's a picture. If we took a few steps back and you've got all the other visual stimuli you know that this is very difficult to see. So sometimes you're not looking for a complete reptile, you're just looking for parts of their body that they're exposing. And we've got a great image here of two adders, and they're exactly where we might expect to find them. You've got the shorter grass here, but you know that when they're disturbed, they're gonna be slithering off into this undergrowth here. It's gonna be very difficult to follow them, it's gonna be very difficult to find them. And again here, Looks like we've got a common lizard and you know exactly where that common lizard's going to go if you disturb it. They'd know where their escape routes are 
and they want to get away quickly when disturbed. And it's worth mentioning as well, uh, if you are near bodies of water, grass snakes um, tend to be around water. Uh, that's where they're found. They are amphibian specialists. They tend to eat uh, frogs and newts as well if they can get them. Um, and you will quite often in, in summer, in the warmer months, find them swimming at the edges of ponds or even in the middle of ponds. Uh, so do keep your eye out for grass snakes near water. So that is a very brief introduction to how you do a visual survey. What do you do when you actually have seen a reptile and you want to record it? I would recommend using Frog Life's Dragon Finder app. Uh, so you can get this on your phone. Uh, if you go to your app store, just type in Dragon Finder and you can use this app to identify different reptiles and different uh, amphibians. It's got loads of information about them, but you can use it to record a sighting as well. And we really need you guys to record your sightings and send them to us. It helps us better identify areas that might need uh, better habitat management or that might need increased connectivity. And this is where we really need your help. Use the Dragon Finder app to record reptiles in your local space. So each year, if you can carry out two to four daylight -like surveys, like I've just gone over, uh, and then submit any data through Dragon Finder, um, that is what this project is all about. We're looking to improve the records that we have for reptiles because there is a real paucity of data and it makes it far more difficult to do good conservation work when we don't have the data available to us. Okay, I have no idea how long I've gone on for, um, but I'm hoping we have time enough to do an identification quiz. So we're gonna put your ID uh, to the test. So I am gonna show you a series of images and I want you to try and identify the species. And if you can, I want you to identify the sex as well. So you won't be able to do this for all of them, um, but if you can, identify the sex. And I'm gonna throw up a poll on the screen uh, so once I work out where it is, you don't need to do this with a pen and paper. You just need to click your answers on the polls and I'm going to give you around 30 seconds or so to answer the question. So you should see on your screen, the poll in, has just come up. Uh, cast your votes. What do you think you can see? And also, can you guess the sex? So I actually managed to see my first adder of the, of the year, uh, this, this previous weekend that's just gone. If any of you are from the West Midlands, I was at Canuck Chase and it was a fantastic sighting. F thoroughly enjoyed myself. You've had about 30 seconds, so I'm just gonna end the polling and let's see what you guys have got. So we've got a great response here. So most people thought this was an adder, spot on. Um, hopefully you noticed that zigzag pattern Okay, you can't quite see the eyes, so you can't tell by the eye color or the eye shape, uh, but you hopefully saw that zigzag pattern. Uh, and the majority of you put male as well, so I'm really pleased at that. Um, so that sort of lighter gray or brown color with the dark, usually black zigzag pattern. So fantastic. So moving on to the second species. There you go. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds once again. What do we have? Okay, I see 30 seconds up. Let's see what we've got. So great. Majority of you are saying common lizard. Exactly what it is. We can see scales. So that rules it out as a newt. Um, and we've got a bit of a mix between whether this is female or there's not enough information. I would say there is limited information. If I had to guess, I would maybe say female, like most of you have said because we've got a bit of a dark flank here. 
You can't see the top, so it's very difficult to see that vertebral line that would give us more information. We can't see the base of the tail. So I, if you have put not, not enough information, I, if that's erring on the side of caution, but I would, I would maybe agree. Um, my best guess would be female, but if someone said, are you sure? I would say no. Okay, moving on to number three. What do we have here? Okay, that's your 30 seconds. Great, so most of you've got a slow worm. You're all doing really well at this, uh, and that's exactly what it is. So we can't see all of the body here, but we can see very smooth, shiny skin that the slow worm has. And the majority of you have also said female as well. Top stuff. So I would definitely say this is a female. You can just about see the dark flanks. And you can see those very faint dark lines that I mentioned that do run down the length of the body. But it's the shiny skin that you want to be looking for that gives you that positive ID on the slow worm. Uh, I didn't actually share the results there, but you, you guys can see most of you got, got slow worm. So shiny skin, uh, whereas the snakes have very obvious scaly skin. Okay, moving on to number four. There we go. So I've tried to trick you a little bit here. This isn't a reptile. This is, as most of you have guessed, a small newt. Uh, small, small isn't just a descriptor, even though it is very small. Uh, it's, it's what we call uh, the, the two newt species that we know are not great crested newts. But we can tell that this is a newt because it doesn't have scales. It's got that shiny skin. It's probably still damp. Uh, based on its environment or it's just come out of water. Um, but you, you can really tell that it's, it's not a common lizard just by looking at the skin. It lacks the scales of a common lizard. Yeah, and I don't think there's enough information to tell whether there's, this is a male or female. Um, and I didn't even give you that information to begin with. So <laughs> definitely I would say I don't know whether this is male or female. Moving on to number five. Can you guess the species in this picture? Great, so most of you uh, have identified this as an adder. You've all identified this as a snake. Um, so you can tell this is the adder because we've got the zigzag pattern running down the length of the body. It's quite stocky, unlike the, the grass snake, which is much skinnier. But it's the zigzag pattern that gives it away as an adder and not a grass snake. And again, really high proportion of you said female. Uh, let me just share the results which is great. I would definitely identify this as female. It's far too big to be a juvenile, which may have that sort of coloration, uh, but that sort of light brown with the darker brown zigzag pattern uh, is almost always female. So great going. Okay, got a few more. I think we've got three more. Can you guess this species?
Yep, so 87% of you have got it right. This is a slow worm. It's got that smooth, shiny skin. You can't see the individual scales. And some of you have identified this as male. I'm really pleased to see that. You may have noticed the blue spots. So it's far more subtle on this picture than the one I gave you earlier on. But it's also that very dull, browny, grayish color. Uh, it lacks the bronze, golden sort of coloration of the female. Okay, moving on to number seven. What do we have here? Okay, don't you've had your 30 seconds. 100% of you've got grass snake, fantastic. Uh, the workshop has done its job, although I assume a lot of you are naturalists uh, anyway, so you, you may have already known this. We've got the grass snake here, um, that bars, we can just about see the yellow collar. And I would agree that we don't have enough information here to guess the sex. If I was forced into an answer just based on the size of this, probably female, but with no certainty uh, would I guess that that was female. Uh, I didn't share the results, but there you go, I wasn't lying. You've got 100% uh, grass snakes there, so well done. Final one, final image, this one here. Great, so most of you have got common lizard. So we can tell this is a lizard and not a newt because we've got those scales. Um, I would probably say this is female as well. I can't see any bulge at the base of the tail. It's got it, like it's got a fairly slim head. The males tend to have bigger heads. That's a fairly unbroken vertebral line. But you can see beneath the sort of dorsal lateral stripes here, we've got these darker looking flanks that possibly give it away as a female. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if someone actually said, oh no, this isn't a female, this is a male. I would probably say this is a female, um, but it's very, very difficult to tell the differences between male and female the majority of the time. Uh, it's just something nice to have a go at. Okay, you all did absolutely fantastically on the ID quiz. Uh, so I'm very confident that you can go out and correctly identify the four common and or widespread reptiles. And that sort of brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, so I just want to mention the National Lottery Heritage Fund as our funders. Uh, thank you ever so much. Uh, we are going to move on to questions. But if you do have any questions yourself that you want to direct to me after the webinar, uh, here is my email address. We do have a website as well where you will be able to find most of the information I've spoken about today and a little bit more information about the Dragon Finder app as well. Uh, I believe Kieran is about to post links into the chat as well so you can navigate yourself to the website. Uh, but I believe we'll be taking a few questions now. Um, but thank you. Thank you all for attending this webinar. It's been a fantastic opportunity for myself. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. That was brilliant. We've got lots of questions already, so I'm going to jump straight in. Okay, you um, Stephen was asking earlier uh, with me, uh, do you have any tips on how to distinguish common lizards from wall lizards? Yes, so it can be difficult. Um, common lizards tend to be a bit smaller, but the location uh, of where you are is probably the best. Uh, best thing to do. So you, you, you get war lizards 
Uh, and it's worth mentioning these the royal lizards are not a native species here. They have been introduced uh, to, to mainland uh, England. And you, you tend to get them along the south coast. So around Southampton, around Bournemouth. So if you're around those areas, you may have a wall lizard, but if you're not around those areas, chances are it's not. But when you're looking at a wall lizard, they have really long tails. So a wall lizard's tail tends to be around two thirds of its entire body length. Whereas the common lizard, uh, it tends not to, to reach that sort of extent. So look at the tail and you should see a long tail on a wall lizard. Uh, if you look at its limbs, a wall lizard has really leggy limbs. So it can actually lift itself off the ground with its limbs. Common lizards tend not to do this. They have very short, stumpy limbs. And again, if you look at the head as well, uh, common lizards in comparison to wall lizards tend to have stubby heads. So the wall lizards have these long heads, long limbs and long tails. But common lizards don't. Um, Thank but I would, I would say it's the area of, of the country you're in that's the best indication. If you're not on the south coast of England, it's probably not a wall lizard. Well, thank you. Uh, we've had a couple of people asking, how do reptiles cool down and do they swim to cool down? So I don't know if they swim to cool down. Um, so species like adders tend to avoid water where possible. Unless, it's, unless they're trying to get to an area and it's impossible not to cross the water. Grass snakes tend to swim when they're actively hunting or if a male is actively trying to find a female. I don't know whether they swim to cool down because it exposes them. Uh, they will use shaded areas to cool down. They will go underground to cool down. Uh, so slow worms, when it's particularly hot and slow worms don't like getting too warm at all, they will use mammal burrows uh, and they will use any way that they can get underneath tree roots to get to that cooler earth underneath. Uh, so I believe the majority of, of reptiles when they're cooling down will just use their environment. So any area that doesn't get direct sunshine is going to be cooler uh, than anywhere that does. Those are the sorts of areas they're going to be moving to to cool down. And if that isn't enough, they're going to be trying to get underground or underneath something in order to cool down. Great. Any more questions? I think Holly may have frozen, Ben. Um, okay. That might be why we might have lost her. So um, she'll probably knock her video off and try and come back. Okay. Uh, I, I've got a few that have been sent that I forwarded on, so I can ask them on while we wait for Holly to come back. Great. So Katina has asked, what is a good place to put black felt refuge? Uh, so if you're hoping to set up a, a refuge survey, um, you want to be placing your mats in between those habitat interfaces I was talking about. So the best example I can give is is like a patch of scrub that transitions into long, short grassland. And you want to place it somewhere that's very rarely disturbed, so there's not a lot of footfall. Uh, and you want to place it in between those habitats. And you want to put them out two or three weeks uh, before you actually perform your survey. So it has a chance to bed in. It needs to kill off all that vegetation underneath. Um, that allows it to heat up uh, quicker than the surrounding environment and draw reptiles to that, that patch. Uh, but it's in between the, the, the habitats that I would, I would focus on uh, placing them. Uh, but do, do keep them away from um, the public if you can, because most people are very inquisitive and they're gonna be lifting them up uh, when they see them. And if they're disturbed too regularly, it's gonna have a negative impact on the reptiles in that area. So you do have to try and hide them as best you can. <laughs> okay, I noticed that we've got Phil and Sue have got their hand up. If, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Ben your question directly, that would be great. 
Uh, hi, yeah, I was just wondering what sort of range the uh, grass snakes have. So they're less widespread than uh, our adders. And you tend to get the highest densities in the southeast. Um, so they're quite common in the south of England. Wherever you are in the south, there's a good chance if the habitat is suitable, the grass snakes will be there. But far more so in the southeast of England. As you move up the north of England, they do get uh, rarer and rarer. So in the north of England, it's patchy. They do have a patchy dis distribution in the north of England. And when you get to Scotland, um, particularly the, the far north of Scotland, uh, you'll find that adders are actually far more populous than grass snakes. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. If you're in the southeast, you should have loads of grass snakes in all the suitable places. And as you, you move further up the country, uh, the distribution does get a bit, a bit patchier. And, it, and it's hard to tell where they are uh, in the north, actually. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, we're nearly out of time. So I'll ask two very quick questions, uh, Ben, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Joanne is saying, many years ago, should a reptile encounter while searching for tadpoles in a stream in the southwest. A black snake swam through her legs while she was searching for uh, tadpoles. She's saying, would this likely to have been a grass snake or an adder? Based on today's webinar, she would say adder. Is this a correct assumption or could it be a grass snake? So if it was in running water, um, I would say it was an eel. If it was in still water and you're absolutely sure it was a snake, uh, chances are it was an adder looking to get from one place to another so they don't regularly swim. You do get melanistic grass snakes, but they are exceedingly rare. So I wouldn't I wouldn't completely class that out because if there's a good amphibian population uh, where you were, grass snakes are going to be drawn to that area. Um, and it's a really hard one to say, you know, what I think it is. Melanistic adders are, are more common, but they're, they're less regularly seen in water. Whereas grass snakes, melanistic grass snakes are exceedingly rare. But grass snakes are commonly seen in water. Uh, so without any information, it's really hard yeah, running water, head above water, um, Joanne's added in the chat. Okay, so head above water makes it does make it sound like a snake rather than uh, like a young uh, eel. Um, yeah, well, I know. If, I would, I would, if, if the habitat surrounding that area is good for adders, and if there are known populations of adders in that area, I would say it's an adder. And if there's never been a record of an adder in the area, and the habitat isn't suitable for them, I would, I would say it's a grass snake. But it's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> yeah. so the, the very last one is from Jenny, and she's just asking, can she use iRecord for sightings? So do, do you get records from iRecord, or, or does Dragon Finder feed into iRecord? As a Dragon Finder doesn't um, feed into iRecord directly, but it feeds into uh, the national biodiversity network database that iRecord does. So using iRecord and using Dragon Finder, uh, they, the records will end up in the same place, the NBN. And if you're, very, if you're already comfortable using iRecord and that's the one you prefer, uh, then go ahead and use it. Using Dragon Finder is great for us because it helps us identify areas that we can do some great work with. Uh, but the most important thing to take away is just sending off your biological records. That's what's really important here. And if you already have a system and you already have one that you are drawn to and that it works for you, use that one. The important thing is that you're sending in your records because uh, that's what we need. You know, we just need more records uh, for reptiles in general. Um, but if you don't use any, anything on your phone at the moment, I would recommend using Dragon Finder because it's, it's built for that purpose and it's very easy to use and very user friendly. Yeah, so yeah, what a great point to end it on, I think, Ben. Yeah, so obviously, Frog Life are happy to receive reptile records, but the most important thing is to get those records in, into the system somewhere. Yeah, so I think I'd like to say a personal thank you for talking to us today. It's been a great talk. 
Uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but um, yeah, it looks like everybody learned quite a lot because everybody did quite well in the test. So thank you very much, Ben. And if people would like to uh, unmute themselves and say goodbye, they're more than welcome to now. <laughs>